I'm John DJ Desjardins, visual effects supervisor for Zack Snyder's Justice League. I'm gonna try to talk about every major superpower on the movie. First up, we're gonna talk about Superman. The heat vision's kind of like something between a flamethrower and a laser, right? It has a certain character to the edge of it, which is a little bit like a, a jagged, flamey kind of thing that has a direction to it and a frequency to it. When we were working on Man of Steel, we made sure there was a difference between Superman's heat vision and Zod's. I, Superman probably doesn't feel that much pain anyway, but it shouldn't look like it's the easiest thing to do. Like, that's why he doesn't do it all the time, you know? We don't even know if he can see when he does it. But that's why it's always like he does it and then it's kind of like, ah, you know, he turns it off and it's like, okay, where are we? In Man of Steel, when he's a little kid, that's when he first gets it. We didn't want it to ever have a fall off, really, because a lot of times in the other movies, even the Richard Donner movie, it's, it's always kind of weird because it's like a little spotlight on something. You know, it's like, here's the inside of a safe. Here's the, you know, the inside of this box or something. And we just figured it was one of those nightmarish powers where if you turn it on, you see everything like that, you know, and, and that was how we did that. You know, we, we shoot a plate. We, we always survey everything. We always LIDAR everything. We always do an extensive, you know, Enviro cam or texture shoot and hand that over to, in this case, it was Scanline that ended up doing that. And yeah, it was them just looking at everything in the scene and getting all the insides modeled out and, you know, bring it out to various degrees in the composite. Zach had this really interesting rule, you know, or thing that he did when he first flies. He's like doing these super jumps in Man of Steel. He faces the sun and realizes that this is something that comes from inside him. And he kneels down and you see the snow start to go around. And there is a bit of that in Justice League. When he puts on the black suit and comes out, you see him kneel down and the debris and stuff starts going and then he just goes. And Zach would say, I kind of want to put some float into him. Like, do we hang him from wires? Do we put him on a belly pan? Do we put him in a tuning fork? The short answer is we did all of those things. And we knew what we could do to like have him take off from just standing there and become CG. All Henry Cavill had to do was make a move like, I'm going. I think our philosophy never really changed from Man of Steel when it came to Superman and Super Strength. He can really wield that stuff around as quickly as he wants. And so anytime he had to pick up anything, it was usually some kind of green foam, you know, lightweight buck that we used to get his handholds right. I think it was in BBS where he picks up a part of a spacecraft, same kind of thing. All these characters have some kind of super strength, but they have slight differences. And so there were a lot of conversations about who do we think is stronger? You know, is it Wonder Woman or is it Superman? I think Superman probably with raw brute strength is stronger than she is. But remember, she is magical. Now I'm gonna talk about Wonder Woman's powers. In our version, it only lights up when it encircles an organic or like a living thing. Really evident in Zack's Justice League where she actually lassos Catwalk to, as she shoots out after the Parademons just to kind of like change her trajectory and help her land on the Catwalk. But it doesn't light up because it's an inorganic, you know, structure. We had a lot of experience with LEDs and you know we all worked on Watchmen together so Dr. Manhattan LED suit you know we knew that okay let's get a strip of LEDs that we could put into a row the first thing that happened with that was it broke all the time so we realized we only use it to light her up or light the person up that it's surrounding anything in between doesn't matter so we put bungees in the middle that kept it from breaking so much but that's kind of how we did that So the funny thing about that is, we always called it the boosh. <laughs> that's, that's what we called it. Zach and Michael Wilkinson designed them. They're not bracelets, they're gauntlets. Because she's a warrior, you know, it's like, that's what you had. We decided that she's gotta fight. She's gonna fight against Doomsday and all this stuff. So we need something that she can <laughs> do, you know? 
And that's where that came from. <laughs> it literally came from the necessity of the fight. Yeah, we all love the boosh. Next up, Flash. I can't maintain this! Trying to dissect how to do Flash was, I think, one of our more interesting problems on the movie. We had a couple of rules for all this kind of fast travel. One main rule with Flash was we don't ever want to see him run like this. We don't ever want to see that. <laughs> so that's why... Almost like Six Million Dollar Man, the faster he runs, it's almost like the slower he gets. You see him rev up in slow motion with the, the slow motion lightning and then boom, he's gone. If you see him in real time, you can't even see him run. You know, he's just gone. They really just vanish. Huh? Oh, that's rude. And then when you start running with him, he may look fairly normal, but it's generally 48 frames a second, but the exterior is whipping by, right? We always pretended like, we're trying to photograph him, but we can never pick the right frame rate to really get him. So we're, yeah, we all starts to really almost fly. In the junction rescue scene where Barry Allen is rescuing Iris, you know, from this car accident, we came up with a couple of rules. One was if everything else in the world, when you're in flash time with him, looks like it's at 600 frames per second or more, Barry Allen's able to move at a different frame rate, but not quite 24 frames per second normal. We usually shot him at 48 frames per second just to give him a little float. But we knew we have to get into a green screen stage and start doing everything from there. We're like, okay, we need to make that environment in CG. We need to make the crash in CG. And Kiersey is gonna have to be on some kind of rig to float her that's pretty controllable. And she's gonna have to act frozen. If she moves, we're gonna have to stabilize her in post. And so if you look at the footage, it's pretty interesting because first she's in her costume on a KUKA arm motion control rig being floated up while Ezra looks up at her. You pull their hair back and then you make CG hair that can dovetail into their real hairline and make it float the way you need it to float. And as Ezra looked like he was just about to touch her, she would start to roll and he would just kind of pretend to guide her down without touching her too much. This is another rule with the flash. You can't grab someone and save them until she's on the ground. And her clothes kind of get flowy and her hair gets flowy. And then once she's down on the ground, then we kind of go into real time. The time travel was always a part of the end of the movie. Everyone in the Justice League has a particular thing they have to do in the fight at the end. Flash's main job is to build up a charge and give it to Cyborg to be able to do what he needs to do. I can conduct a significant electrical current. I, I might be able to wake the box. But weird things happen as I get close to the speed of light. The time travel thing is fun because Zack was very clear. He wanted the mother boxes to merge. The effect would essentially raise the planet, just erase everything. And he wanted it to be a void, like, a, like just a void with a quasar at the origin and it would become very beautifully cosmic. And the origin of that would come with each of Flash's footsteps. He said, I want like a big bang to come out of each footstep. And that starts to repopulate the void, which when you look behind him, you realize he's actually like a tidal wave pulling. And you have to remember how much time he's actually pulling. Six seconds of time back is what he's doing. It's not much, but it's huge. It's like the hugest thing ever. Yeah, we all know Batman's power is he's rich. What are your superpowers again? I'm rich. And he has a lot of gadgets. Our version of Batman and the gadgets is probably a little bit different. Zach really wanted to model our Batman on Frank Miller's Dark Knight Returns. The Batmobile is still beefy and it's got some bat properties to it. He's got the grapple gun, which he uses in different ways. In Justice League, we extend the powers a little bit or the gadgets a little bit so that he has a gauntlet. You know, you could see Alfred shoot one of the Kryptonian guns, which I thought was pretty fun because we kept those from Man of Steel. Yeah, same effect and everything. Well, we see it get used to absorb parademon gunfire. And ultimately, it's, it's gonna save his life in his rematch against Superman, I guess, <laughs> in the park battle. Mission to come aboard. 
uh, Aquaman whose strength we think comes from the fact that he can withstand, you know, crazy underwater pressures that no human being can. He's half human, half Atlantean, so he can he can breathe underwater and he is really strong from being able to be underwater. Some kind of hydrokinesis. That trident is a way for him to channel his hydrokinesis and that's what he's doing when he tries to hold the water back, you know. You just can't do it indefinitely. And I would also think too that the hydrokinesis is the other thing that helps he and other Atlanteans swim underwater. Even when you look at the first time you see him in BVS, when he kind of attacks the underwater camera and then speeds off, he's just flying underwater. That's what we think they do. They, we think that they manipulate like some kind of underwater slipstream. We had some really early conversations where Zach's like, I don't think Atlanteans can talk underwater. And so that's where the air bubble rule came from. We figured if they have hydrokinesis, they can open up an air bubble if they want to have a long conversation. I like it. It's quiet. It's Next up, Cyborg. I think maybe his biggest power is manipulation of data, you know, and his control over the virtual world. He can fly and he has certain weapons that can come out of his body. I feel like we don't really know what all of those are, but we tried to represent the most popular ones, you know, especially with the Sonic Cannon. Relax, Alfred. I'll take it from here. Put Ray in a performance capture outfit. Make sure he's got all the interactive light elements that we need. So he's got an eye. It's gonna light up his face and anybody close to him. He's got a chest piece that represents the energy in his chest. It's gonna light him up here. It's gonna light up anybody standing close, like when he talks to Diana and so forth. That's it, you know, he basically lived with that for months. <laughs> Steppenwolf. This was a big ticket item. He's a spacefaring being, so he he can he can jump a lot, I guess. I guess maybe Earth's gravity is nothing for him, so he can jump around very freely. He doesn't fly, but he does have the electro axe. These characters are all based on Jack Kirby's fourth world characters, which are just LSD psychedelic trippy as hell. So you gotta have an electro axe. We wanted him to use it. It's got lightning to it. it it's it's pretty R-rated in this version. He does hack people to pieces. Yeah, that's that's Steppenwolf. That's good. It was always adaptive armor, which is why it has all the little, we call them blades. You know, it's, it's made of all these little blades and they all need to animate. And you almost call it mood armor in some ways. You know, it's when it's docile, it kind of looks kind of low key, although it has a little flutter to it, you know? And then when he's mad, it's super spiky, you know, <laughs> which is kind of fun. <laughs> but we always loved it. We always loved it. And Rich Citrone played Steppenwolf. He had a performance capture suit on, and the Electro Axe was, I don't think it was, a, it must have been like a scaled version for him. And it had a bunch of LEDs along the blade area, which is where most of the energy would come from. Like that scene where he like comes down on Superman, Henry could stand there and it would glow, you know, it would light him correctly. So we were really happy to finally be able to execute it. I'm real happy with it in the movie. Omega Beam kills Volko and it was our one moment to do it because we always wanted to do the Omega Beams. The Omega Beams, again, Jack Kirby, fourth world, trippy LSD stuff. So that was fun. Yeah, jaggy beams, jaggy beams. Green Lantern Power Ring. Uh, he's an ancient Green Lantern, you know, 15,000, 20,000 years ago. It wanted his power to be raw, not have a construct to it. Beams. Beams are cool. Well, Martian Manhunter. I'll be in touch. Martian Manhunter shapeshifting. Old conversation with Zach. Always thought it'd be cool for him to be Swanwick. Put in the scene where he's Martha. Really hard to do because we couldn't do any kind of capture on anybody to do this. We did shoot Harry Lennox remotely because it was COVID. It is COVID times and it was COVID times. Uh, and we had video of his face delivering these lines that Zach had for him. Uh, but the entire creation was done remotely from home and animated by a very good team of animators at Scanline. Martian Manhunter, we always love him. By the way, he's one of the mainstays of Justice League, so 
we wanted to really bring him into it by the end of the movie. So I think that's every major superpower in Zack Snyder's Justice League, but I probably left something out, so I apologize. We ended up doing something on 2,700 shots, you know, in about seven months. And again, it wasn't actually the execution of the work. The simplest shots were the ones to start from scratch. <laughs> the, the hardest ones were everything else where something had been done to varying degrees. When I'm working with Zack, I always do a director's cut. Every time. <laughs>